Welcome to this first episode of the fifth series of the Maternity and Midwifery Hour. My name is Dr. Jenny Hall, and I'm honoured to be chairing tonight's session um, instead of Sue McDonald. And Sue is very sorry that she's not here this week, but she's having herself a good break before things really start again for this term. So hello, Sue, because I know that you'll be watching this at some point. But it's uh, my, my pleasure to be here to actually be leading this session today. For those of you who are familiar with um, Midwifery Hour, these sessions started last year um, during COVID lockdown, the first COVID lockdown, and we designed to provide continuing professional development opportunities for midwives, student midwives, and others in maternity care. And these are all actually still accessible now and available and will be for the future too. And of course, huge thanks to Matt Flix and video streaming from maternity experts for um, streaming these sessions for us. CPD and revalidation, ideal online resources for midwife students and everybody. And there is also a new page, a new web page that's dedicated to the midwifery hour at the top of the um, maternity and midwifery forum website. So if you haven't looked at that website, then do go along and have a look and you can go back and listen to any of the sessions um, that have been shown over this past year, over the past four series. But tonight, I'm very pleased to say that I'm joined by Jackie Williams and Verena Wallace. Um, Jackie's the Senior Midwifery Advisor and Verena is the Senior Midwifery Advisor relating to policy at the Nursing and Midwifery Council. And tonight we have a discussion about the language of the new future midwife standards. Um, so the first thing that we do is that we ask you about your moment of the week or the summer, because actually this is the first time since we're back. Um, so is there a reflection or event that stands out that's good or bad that you want to share with us? Marina or Jackie, which, which one of you would like to say first? I'll go, Jenny. Um, I think for me, it's 9-11. That's very much in my mind this week. Mm. Um, I seem to have been wrapped up very much in a lot of the broadcasts and I've learned ever such a lot, you know, about that day, which I hadn't appreciated. And I think what's really coming into the fore is some of the unknown stories and stories mm. you didn't think about at the time. And of course, for us as midwives, it's thinking about on that day, there were a lot of um, unborn babies who sadly lost their fathers. And of course, they'll be um, very shortly in the next few months celebrating their 20th birthdays. Mm. So that's sort of in, I know it's that's a sad and poignant way to start, but that's sort of been in my mind this week. Mm. And very powerful, isn't it? Very powerful to think yeah. that, that there are babies that, that were born after the event who actually have also been part of the story. And, and there uh, was one on ITV actually yesterday and it was described, it was actually taking you through all the various flats that were not that far, several blocks away from, mm. from that area. And one of them was showing a woman with a very young baby and she looked absolutely terrified because they wanted to get out of their building but they couldn't because there was literally nowhere to go and they were literally being covered in all of that dust through their flat mm. when you see those sort of stories um and those images it it uh, it really um it really stays with you yeah the reality comes through doesn't it yeah yeah Thank you for that. Verena, have you got anything that you would like to, to share? Yes, um, picking up on, on Jackie's point, uh, it does take you back to where you were at the time because it's one of those mm. things rather like this assassination of Jay that you, you remember where you were. And um, JFK would have been my parents' generation. And for me and our generation, I think it'll be where were you? And I can remember that I was a community midwife in Leeds at the time. And I can remember getting a phone call from uh, someone to say, you've got to find a television mm. and asking the lady um, when I went into the woman's house, would you mind if we turned on the television? And I thought I was watching a film. 
because it was it was so unbelievable. But it it reminded me of what I was um, doing this week, which was actually sitting down and reminiscing with um, my favourite 96 year old, who's my fiance's mum. And we'd been going through photographs. We found photographs of her wedding, which was again at the end of another enormous event in the context of the UK and uh, and Europe and the world, which was um, around the time of the end of the Second World War. And looking at the wedding dress, and I said to her, "Gosh, did you have to save up all your ration coupons for the wedding dress?" And she said, "No, I got it sent from America." So it's that sort of loop where we're all interconnected, even though it's a thousand, several thousand miles away. And it's, it's that aspect of, of reminiscing, which has, I think, um, come through in both Jackie and my stories uh, this evening. It's about remembering and learning mm. from it um, going forward. But um, yes, it's an inter- interesting Thank time. You. Yeah. And, yes, it's reminded me, actually, because my I, I was on maternity leave, I seem to remember, with having had my youngest, who actually will be 21 at the end of this month. So, hmm. She and I remember that I, I had gone round to a friend's house to go and have a cup of coffee, and I walked in the door and looked at the telly, and because she'd had it on to see the plane going straight into a um, into the town, mm-hmm. and and I shall forever forever remember that because obviously with with mm-hmm. having my youngest as well at the time, so it's it's very powerful. It'll be getting everybody now thinking themselves where they were, and some people oh, will be listening who mm-hmm. actually weren't even alive so (laughs) it's something always to remember and and actually going on from that obviously tonight we also want to still remember what is going on in our current circumstances we're obviously out of lockdown for anybody who's watching from um other parts of the world because we do get a global audience for this um in the uk that we we are now sort of just about um, walking around and being able to to um, continue our lives in a very slow way, most of us. But I want to also send very good wishes and thanks to everybody, all the midwives and maternity services who've been caring and supporting people or have had actually COVID-19. And, and our thoughts are with those who've lost their lives and their families and friends at this time, because we, we have lost um, members of our profession as well during this past 18 months and I do know that there's a number of people who have got COVID and suffering from long COVID as well so we do send our healing thoughts to you if you're able to be listening to us at this time but this also includes student midwives and educators who've had had to adapt to courses over the past year I mean you've been amazing actually how how you have done that and but I know that a lot of you are still juggling with families and with situations at the moment Um, and having to to now go back and start courses. And and I know that some universities obviously are opening up and people are going to be allowed back on campus. And we were just reflecting before we started about how it is that um, we're going to be seeing people face to face at um, conferences and meetings. And it's it's quite a quite a strange thing that that we're going to be suddenly sort of being able to see people. But we know it's been a very tough time for you all and wishing you all well as you actually start back on your courses for this year. And so thinking about this week and what's been happening in the news. um, Well, I could mention something about the the government yesterday, actually sort of looking at the health and social care bill. And it's something we're going to have to keep a, a big watch on because that's going to have a big impact on us all as we develop over the future. Um, But the particular thing that I'm going to focus on at the moment is that this month is actually Fetal Alcohol Syndrome Awareness Month. And um, it's also International Fetal Alcohol um, Awareness Day tomorrow. Um, So there will be some things in the press in relating to fetal alcohol syndrome. So if you are not very aware of, of what this means and what the effect of this can be for women and for their their families um, ongoing, then do have a look at some of the articles and the websites um, which are related to this particular topic. In fact, there is an article that was 
placed onto the um, maternity forum website at the beginning of this month, which is about fetal alcohol syndrome. So you might want to check that out as well as something to, to have a look at. And also please do check out the resources page um, that we have for today and for the previous talks that we've had. There's lots of information there that you can find. And the other thing that I need to tell you about is that next week on Wednesday will be the forthcoming Wales Maternity and Midwifery Festival um, on the 15th of September, a week today. And this will be an opportunity if you're in Wales or able to get over there that you can come to Cardiff and there's going to be online presentations that will be taking place within the venue itself. And also that there will be some workshops that will be taking place there as well, of which I'm, I should be doing one. Um, but so do check out the details, check out the details on the website. And if you're not able to come, of course, you can still watch it online completely. And you can also register to receive the box set as well at the end of the week. So, so do have a look at that and, and see if you are able to come along to that. So there's a lot happening at the moment. This term is kicking off big time. So enough of me, enough of me wittering on. And I'm delighted to introduce to you, um, start with Dr. Jackie Williams, who is, the, as I've said, is the Senior Midwifery Education Advisor for the NMC. She's a very experienced midwifery academic and practicing midwife with over 30 years involvement in pre and post reg midwifery programs. As an academic, Jackie's continued to keep strong links with midwifery pra practice and is passionate about the unique role of the midwife and women-centered care. She's a senior fellow with the HEA, Higher Education Academy, and she has a particular area of expertise in quality assurance. Her education interests are in open and distance learning, and she's created resources for open access repositories, including developing a unique midwifery repository. And she's also an experienced midwifery expert witness. Her doctoral work is researching whether or not resilience develops in student midwives, very pertinent at the moment, mm. and as they navigate the undergraduate midwifery programs. And Jackie's current role is to support the development of the new midwifery education standards, which we're going to be talked about today, and the wider work on midwifery matters across the NMC. And Verena, they're going to be doing a bit of teamwork here, is <laughs> the Senior Midwifery Advisor of Policy at Nursing Midwifery Council, and she was appointed in January 19. What a good time to start. Most recently, Verena was the midwifery and children's nursing officer at the Department of Health in Northern Ireland, and she was the local supervising authority midwifery officer for nine years until 2015, having previously held senior roles as a deputy chief nurse, head of midwifery and consultant midwife for public health. She trained as a general nurse in Belfast and has worked as a midwife in Scotland, England and Northern Ireland. I would now like to hand over to you both. Thank you very much. The screen is yours. Thank you, Jenny. And we're both delighted to be here uh, this evening and have this opportunity to, to talk to you all. Um, so we've entitled our talk, The Language of the New Midget Free Standards, because as we've said, they were published a couple of years ago now. Um, so people are becoming much more familiar with them. And I'm sure many people on the call have been involved with their local universities as they develop the new programmes. But what we're really turning our attention to is really what these new standards mean for all midwives on our register, not for midwifery programmes. So we've just got a short presentation uh, to show you. And um, really we're, what we're really looking forward to is the discussion and the questions you might have afterwards. Next slide, please. So what I've done here is just listed really the key changes, just things for you to perhaps hone in on when you look at the, the documents themselves. So we've got six interconnected dom domains. Each of those domains are really important. None are more important than the other. They are all working together, very much interconnected. 
And then throughout the proficiencies, we have 17 themes that run almost like a golden thread. We were delighted when our council approved that the new standards would be based on the Lancet framework. So that's the quality framework for uh, maternal and newborn health. And I think that was really a pivotal moment in terms of the direction of travel of these proficiencies and what they, how they would be presented and, their, their, and how they would work in practice. I think uh, it's also important to say that the role of the midwife is really clearly articulated in these standards. In a way, there wasn't a place to really articulate the role and it's there front and centre at the beginning of these standards, which are really, really important. There is emphasis on the views, the preferences and the decisions that women and their partners and families make, really putting women and their families at the centre of care. Sometimes those women will be making decisions which we perhaps wouldn't encourage or advise, and we might consider that they are perhaps going to incur more risk. But these standards really stress the importance of women making decisions on the evidence informed information that we give them and it is their decisions and we need to support them in that. There's greater emphasis on human rights, ethics, cultural competence and there's a whole domain on continuity of care and carer. So at the point of registration these, these midwives, as they join our register, will be able to be proficient to work in those teams. There's greater emphasis on interdisciplinary working, and there's a range of new skills, and one of them is the full systematic examination of the newborn, but there are others. Um, so that's also important that some of those skills, which may have been more traditionally um, developed uh, following initial registration, are now actually embedded in the undergraduate programme. And because we know that many of our referrals are to do with medicines management and administration, it was really important to ensure that midwives joining our re register had improved knowledge and enhancement in medicines. Next slide, please. So the reason we wanted to talk about the language today um, is that our new standards don't talk about risk, but we're very mindful that risk is, is very embedded in the language within trusts and health boards. Because these standards are based on the framework for quality maternal and newborn health, it is important to, to consider what this actually means for the role of the midwife, because what this is saying is that all women and all newborn infants need the care of a midwife. Those essential skills, those essential teaching and educating that, that you all do. But there are also some women because of um, their circumstances, their particular needs when they enter the maternity journey, or they might develop complications throughout that journey. Some will need additional care and some will need the input from a range of other healthcare professionals and social care professionals. And it's important to think about the role of the midwife with those women and newborn infants as you coordinate that care, working closely with our, our colleagues. And if I give a very, very sort of simple example, that say for example, a, um, a woman was having midwife midwifery led care, things were all quite straightforward, but for whatever reason, she needed a cesarean section. And then the cesarean section would be um, the perhaps initial emergency will have um, subsided and all was well with her and the baby. And if it was her choice, she would then continue with midwifery care to have early skin to skin and early breastfeeding. And it, that's a, a sort of a simple example to try and explain that often when women sort of ended up needing more additional care with the input and others, they often missed out on those essential midwifery input. And this is really demonstrating the importance that alongside the additional care that they need from others, the midwife still de delivers the midwifery care. Next slide, please. Um, 
Our current work, of course, is that we work with the four country future nurse, future midwife oversight assurance boards. So they are at na the national level undertaking activities to ensure that these standards are adopted. Um, by this, this, as we start this September, many, many um, universities now have developed and have had their programs approved and ha have adopted the new standards. So we're sort of in the phase now of almost the majority having done that, and there will be still some to follow and they will develop their programs and everyone will be delivering these programs by September, 2022 against the new standards. So these assurance boards are really very much working with their uh, national education providers and others to ensure that um, service is ready. From that, we're doing a whole range of stakeholder, local trust, health board, regional meetings to try and get these messages out. Um, and what was really interesting is when we were doing the work to develop the new standards, we had real genuine interest from women, their partners and families. And um, of all the responses we got to that consultation, over a thousand were from the public. And we really wanted to close that loop with them to say, this is what we have done. Um, and unfortunately, COVID has prevented us doing it. So we've done a number of things online, but one of the things we have done is we've developed an animation for midwives to show um, the women in their care. And we hope that you can use this link, um, take it back to your trust or health board, use it in clinics, use it perhaps in postnatal wards before women go home or wherever women are receiving their care. So that it actually talks to them about the role of the midwife and working with their midwives. Um, there is some sort of, back messages if you like about the standards so if the women were or their partners were interested they could go and you know read more about it but it's more about giving them assurance about how midwives are trained and continue their professional education and work very much with them focusing in on their needs and what they want from their care and then the other piece of work we're beginning to think about is revalidation now Revalidation to change drastically would, would mean, you know, quite extensive processes. So I'm not suggesting that. But I think one of the things we want to try and get the message out is that when you are revalidating, have a look at these new standards. Benchmark your practice against those standards. For those of you who are a practice supervisor and a practice assessors, are you ready to receive the students on the new programmes are you familiar with the standards? Do you need other professional development? And many um, heads of midwifery and directors of midwifery are now doing gap analysis of the staff to try and see where the gaps are so that they can really be ready for supporting the new students on these programmes. Next slide, please. Because this is what it really means. It, these standards really are for the midwives supporting the, the, the student midwives. We mustn't forget the student midwives on current programmes. It was our standards that were woefully out of date. Many of those students will come with those proficiencies because programmes have developed beyond the our standard requirements. But there inevitably will be some sort of um, phase where perhaps some of the, the students, as they join the register the first time, enter into re um, preceptorship programs will need some sort of additional support so that they will be sort of at the same level as the students will come out on these programs. Um, thinking about your role and your scope of practice and your development and of course what we mustn't forget is that now student midwives can be supervised by other care healthcare professionals and are they ready do they understand what their requirements are. And Professor Mary Renfrew, who we were so privileged to have to work on this work, she talked about these being transformative standards. And people have said, well, what does that mean? Well, it actually means that this could develop maternity services and enhance it, and they can be used to do that. Next slide, please. So we have a question. How do we know 
that every midwife has adopted the new standards of proficiency in their scope of practice. And what I've got, and I'm hoping the slides will be shared, is just some questions that you uh, on the next slide that you might just like to ask yourself. I won't go through them because I've already covered it, but it's talking about what opportunities are there for student midwives, which obviously the educators will be working on and the practice educators as well. But thinking about yourself as well, so that when students come into practice, they are actually seeing these, these new approach to standards and this language in practice. I think that's probably my last slide. The next one is, thank you, yes. So that's just the short presentation, Jenny, and both Varina and I will be very happy to take any questions and carry on the discussion. Thank you very much. Um, if you're just joining us, this is the Maternity and Midwifery Hour with me, Jenny Hall, and with um, Jackie Williams and Verena Wallace from the NMC talking about the midwifery standards. And if you do have any questions, then please put them through on the live stream, either down below or if you're on Facebook, they can put the questions through there and I will field them. I have a little another screen here beside me so that I can actually check the questions. But I've got I've got one question that I I have for you. Um, this is obviously a big change, isn't it, for for practice areas. It's a big change for education as it is. So there's a lot going on and especially with with COVID and things have been a big pressure for everybody to, to try and get these standards through and validation. But what, what would you advise midwives who currently think that their local ways of practice are not the same as the ways of the students are going to be developed? What, what would you advise to them to, to do or to, well, to do? basically. <laughs> Great question, Jenny. I'm going to let Verena answer that for us. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Mm. Uh, yes, somebody I thought that might come my way. Um, it's, it's, as Jackie said, it's a very good question, Jenny, and I think um, uh, Jackie alluded to it um, maybe uh, through a presentation, which is that um, what we're trying to do is to make people aware of potential gaps and the these standards as with every iteration of standards it's it's a jump and it's a change and this would have happened with you know the standards um when they last came out um the 2009 standards and then it's happening again with these standards where there's there's a, a change and it also goes along with the changes that happen um with policy at government level and so on so there's a uh, there's an overlap and, a, and an in interlinking between our standards and, for example, continuity of care and care, and then also around um, some of the things that will be um, old hat to some areas um, of the country and that are very new to um, other areas. And the classic that um, is, is often used to illustrate the point is the examination of the newborn, which for some areas of the country, they've been doing it for years and um, they've, they've, they've gone through all the glitches and, and getting it sorted and everything. And then there are other parts of the country where this is a, a new development moving something that would have been done post-reg into the sort of pre-reg space. So there are things that are going along and that's what we're trying to really get across is about thinking about in your particular area, when you've looked at these standards, for some people, they're going to say, we're actually, you know, we're doing pretty well on this. And I think we've got that covered. And yes, and we've made sure and we've gone through our curriculum and we've refreshed everything and we've reviewed and we've included and we've talked to everybody. And we're doing that joint work with the providers of um, the services in our area and also people who use the services so that we're getting the complete picture and everybody's contributing so that we're getting a really, really good thorough educational experience for the students when they're going through our particular um, educational institution. But we are aware that the, the language differences 
that students a lot about universal care and additional care needs. And when they go into practice, they'll still be hearing the language of risk and risk and risk, and low risk and high risk. And we're not saying that that's going to change overnight, but it's about thinking about practice in the context of individualized care, person-centered care, and putting the woman and her baby at the absolute center of care, which is implicit in our standards. And it's knitted through, as, as people would describe, it's a golden thread. You know, it, the service and the care that we provide is all about doing the best for the woman and her baby in their particular circumstances. So you're thinking about the context of where they are, about their family context, about their own cultural needs and, and so on, and all those um, other accompanying needs that may mean that we have to think very carefully about how you're going to provide that care and pull in the multidisciplinary team and other, other people who you need to help so that you get the best possible experience for the woman and her baby when they're going through the process and their maternity journey. But um, it's, it's not without its sort of trickiness, which is why we're trying to sort of raise it as, a, as an issue at this stage, mm. at, which is at the start of the academic year, because the language is quite different. And, and I don't think people really realised that we hadn't talked about clinical risk, you know, until mm. they were sort of reading them in depth. And it was like, mm. yes, and um, that, that, is, that is a definite difference. And the other thing is that continuity of care is at different places in different parts of the, of the UK as well. Mm. So in some areas, they're doing... Um, small sort of um, groups of, that are practicing continuity of care but the other the other parts of the system are and are organizationally quite traditional and then in other places they're racing ahead and they've got all sorts of things going on that are, are taking them and of course it's it's all complicated by the whole covid and the pandemic and so on mm. so i think there's a lot of work to be done but what we're trying to do is say you know this is um these standards have been produced on the back of a, a huge amount of consultation, a huge amount of involvement. And as Jackie said, terrific feedback from women who were passionately interested in these standards and could see how they would influence their births and the births of their friends and family mm. going forward. Because we don't um, produce brand new standards um, every other year. You know, it's 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 generally in the past been a decade, <laughs> at least. So, um, what we what we were keen to do was to to future proof them, and also make sure that they were outcome focused, so that um, people get to the same destination but using slightly different paths, and it will depend again on their particular educational institution and so on. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing my talking for Ireland thing. So I'll hand back to Jackie, who, who may want to, to, to add to my... Jackie, I'm going to give you two... I'm going to give you two tangible examples, actually, um, because I see these standards almost like a tool that we can be used to develop yourself as a midwife, because this is the benchmark for joining the register. And, you know, you might have de professional development needs, which you've not had the opportunity, but it is also the development of the service. Now, we've actually mapped these standards in, for two things. We've mapped them against the Ockenden report, and it was really interesting, but the, both Verena and I were quite staggered, actually, about how, when you pick out all the proficiencies, which meet it, how they mirror so we know that these standards aren't the only answer to maternity services, but it, we do recognise it has a part to play. Mm. So that if you were actually practising in some of those ways, it could make a huge difference to that safety agenda. The other thing we did was we mapped it against the Turning the Tide report mm -hmm. to see how that, that fared. Mm -hmm. And again, very, very interesting in terms of, again, some of the language isn't always quite what's used in the media or perhaps in certain circles. And that's all about being future proof and picking language really carefully so that it had that longevity. But it, they really held up in terms of what you if you were practicing in that way, how it how it sort of 
And I think that, and that was really interesting because we, we did that within probably 14, 15 months maybe of them being published. And we were really pleased to see how they were beginning to sort of hold up. So I think it, it's really thinking about these proficiencies as a tool, really. Mm -hmm. Having those conversations, mm -hmm. thinking about how they can be actually adopted by practice as well as sort of individual midwives and, of course, midwifery programs. Mm. Yeah, I was just reflecting and thinking about the, the, the fact that you were saying that within the standards, it, it doesn't mention clinical risk. And I know that there will be many midwives going out there, um, but all our policies and all our, our guidance actually for us as, as practitioners includes the word risk, whether they're high mm. risk or low risk or, or whatever. So, so it sounds like that, that they might need to revisit some of these documents and that's going to take time before yeah. that gets mm. through and practice, we're delighted doesn't it? to tell you for England, we have got a forthcoming meeting with the CQC to talk about these new standards. Mm. And I think that is another sort of way that we can work with others to sort of talk about the standards and see how it play, it, it, how they position yeah. themselves, if you, if you like, within other people's work. So mm. we're looking forward to sort of mm -hmm. sharing that because again, I can see us having those sort of conversations, you know, around mm. uh, the, the language and whatever that has to offer. That yeah. of course is England and we'd be delighted to yeah. do it with others in the other three countries. Mm. I think I think it's also worth saying, um, Jenny, that uh, we're not suggesting a sort of um, overturning the barrel, as it were. What what it will um, enable and hopefully uh, make people think through is how you share information with women about what their personal chances of something happening are in the context of, as I was saying, the, you know, the individualized care and the person-centered care, because it does vary. And that sort of comes out in the sort of Montgomery ruling. You have to, you know, not tailor it too much, but you, you, you're thinking of the, the information mm. in, the, in the context of that woman's particular circumstances and her particular needs. And again, the, the sort of area that she's in and so on and so forth. And just going back to the point about future proofing, I mean, I can remember standing somewhere and um, using um, a, an illustration that, that um, Professor Renfrey had used, which was around, you know, every generation has something that um, you don't know about when you start your education and then it comes out of the woodwork. And, and I was standing up there burbling away, probably in January 2020, <laughs> about, you know, um, how when I when I was starting my training, you know, at the beginning of my education, uh, my training as a nurse, nobody knew anything about HIV. And by year three, it had sort of hit the headlines and, you know, it was all over the place. And nobody knew mm. what it was. And, da -da. and that for this generation of student midwives, there would be something that would come over the hill that we wouldn't know. <laughs> and the next thing, you know. So, but if you actually look at the standards, you know, in, in 1.4, it talks about demonstrating the knowledge, skills and ability to identify, critically analyze and interpret research evidence local, national, international data and reports, and then use, share and apply research findings as 1.5 and lessons from data and reports to promote and inform best midwifery policy. And I think we've seen that in action because we've seen the work that has, has come out, you know, very, very fast from organisations like the RCOG and the RCM working together, doing that multidisciplinary, professorially led, fantastic evidence-based work, you know, as the evidence has emerged. And again, that's been done at speed, at pace, and at a, at a, at a level that we wouldn't have, we'd have found hard to believe mm. if you told us like, <laughs> two Absolutely. years ago, but it, it's been remarkable. And, yeah. um, you know, the experience that, that this generation's students have had and will have will be something that, that will probably stay with them the whole way through mm. their careers as, as midwives, because it's been so unusual. I mean, it's a vastly overused term now, unprecedented, 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 but it's actually true. You know, this is, this mm. is very, very unusual. And although it's maybe hard to to realize that at the time it's it's absolutely um 
invaluable experience mm. and um, it's just different experience to previous generations of midwives but there will always be something that comes up and that's what we've uh, tried to do with the writing of the standards so that they're e they're able to flex to absorb the things that come out that we know nothing um, about um, at the beginning and that sure. there will be yeah. you know once COVID goes there'll be or is is managed there'll be something else yeah, yeah further down the line and the one thing uh, we were talking about this the other day and it's that thing about research that that sort of change your changes your whole way of thinking and uh, again I think for our generation there was something that we were doing that we were absolutely convinced we could we could have had a, a rational explanation for which was putting babies down to sleep on their front and then the evidence emerged and we just overnight virtually completely changed the way we did things and that was on the basis of emerging evidence and mm. uh, the realization that the safest thing to do was not what we had been doing but this putting babies with their feet to the foot of the cot and mm. so on so you know that there will be something and, and I look forward to seeing you know what it is because it, it is fascinating that you've got something that's absolutely embedded and then the evidence changes and the research emerges mm. and the next thing you're you're thinking afresh so absolutely um, we've mm -hmm, it's but it 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 does make life tricky because they're they're you know you're you're not thinking all the time in absolutes but i think the key thing that's coming through is personalize the care individualize the care mm. and t uh, and make sure that you're passing on the information in an understandable way mm. to whoever you're um, working with absolutely and thank goodness for those wonderful professors who did all that work mm. in relation to covid last year i have a, a a raft of questions that are coming through excuse me just oh, looking to my, to my screen so um laura gilmore hello laura can i ask if there are any standards that are expected of a first year student in completing nipes I did my NIPE training in my training and was shocked to see the lack of information required for first years in the trust I used to work at compared to my cohort. So she's obviously had an experience of, of learning NIPE within her first year, by the sound of it, where she was. Yeah, so thank I'm you, Laura, for that question. I mean, it's a really interesting one because these proficiencies are to be met at the point of registration, but how they are met and when um, almost operationalized if you like is up to the individual midwifery programs and I know from personal experience um, as an LME you know that that university was was considering that they would do um, that um, examination and gain those skills throughout the three years whereas others have adopted a different approach I think also what is important is because we are a, a four country regulator, we're not specifically using the language from England. In term, so we are talking about a systematic examination of the newborn. And um, just to give you a little um, insight into um, midwives who are perhaps wanting to join our register from abroad or indeed return to practice using the test of competence, they will have to show proficiency in that particular examination. And there is having to be some really, really looking at how that is delivered because perhaps how it's been delivered traditionally is not going to work with, for people who are A, preparing to do that test from abroad and then can only come to the country for 10 days while they do the test. So I think what I'm saying, Laura, is that it's absolutely for the university to decide how they will present that that program in terms of that knowledge base. And they will adopt anything because there isn't sort of a there is some that guidance, but it isn't an absolute standard that has to be met. Mm. Um, so there is some variation amongst that. Well, it's interesting. Um, Belinda Ackerman. Hello, Belinda. How lovely to hear from you. Hi, Belinda. Um, <laughs> my, she's, she, it's a statement really from her, but about, again, it's about NIPE. And she's saying NIPE training is limited to only screening the four areas, i.e. 
eyes, heart, hips and testes, the midwife should be doing the full examination of the newborn, not just the four screening standards for Public Health England. There is a dire lack of standardised practice for this. Mm. And that's why the language was very, very carefully worded within the standards, that it is that full systematic examination. So it's not aligning itself to any one particular national um, approach. Mm. I don't know that's you... tricky, and, though. Yeah. Some, some midwives are only learning or, or mm. going through an IP course and, and then mm. they're not actually doing the whole thing. Yes, I think I think that was a. Um, the point's well made. NIPE is, as Belinda says, it's it's a public health England thing, and it's not called NIPE in the other uh, three countries. Um, so mm. that's why we've we've used systematic examination of the newborn um, as as the phraseology within the standards. But um, I think it's it's probably worth saying that um, we don't set the the nitty gritty of it. The nitty gritty comes through in the curricula, um, and that's that's the difference. We set the overall standards, and as I say, we tried to make them flexible and future proof. But the the nitty gritty of how it's delivered is at curriculum and the AEIs and the providers um, working with um, women and with the student midwives. Mm. Thank you. There seems to be, this seems to have sparked a bit of discussion that's okay. going on at the moment. So, um, yeah, in fact, there's been a follow up there from Laura. Laura, it was difficult when I was doing my training, 14 to 17, to get support, 14 to 17, to get support to achieve our proficiency in the full examination of the newborn. And Belinda is saying that it's an incorrect term, which is what I think we've just been talking about, NIP. Mm -hmm. This is only screening in four areas. And the term should not be mixed up with full examination of the newborn. So it needs to be. Jenny, um, can I just take up Laura's point about sort of support mm. and gaining proficiency? Because I think this is where it's so, so important that to, to recognise that our standards are absolutely um, promoting this partnership working between the university who's obviously delivering the, pro the programme alongside the practice partners so that where programmes are being developed, we expect those practice partners to be around that table talking about how that programme is going to be delivered and absolute partnership in its once it's approved and it's being delivered. And I think if there are students on the call that are sort of, you know, having these um, challenges you know, in, in a whole, it could be a whole range of areas, couldn't it? Not just mm. um, the, the systematic examination, you know, do use the mechanisms that you have to raise these issues because it, it's so, so important that people understand the experience of student midwives, particularly in, with all the challenges that are happening within maternity services currently, because we absolutely want to know that they are getting the, the experience they need to gain their proficiencies to join our, our register, you know, as confident um, uh, midwives as well as proficient midwives. And, you know, there, this is a good time almost at the beginning of the academic year to really think about who do I go to if I've got a sort of a challenge or a problem? Because it's, it's so, so important um, that practice partners do have input where things maybe are not maybe working out as well well mm -hmm. or you know students are having difficulty to meet their proficiencies. Jenny um, it's probably just worth I mean uh, Jackie can pick this up but Jackie I was just wondering if it was worth saying something about the triple SA because the supervision is another sort of change which um, has been a bit mixed because of the whole Covid and emergency mm -hmm. standards and so on and so forth. Yeah, and it's and it was it was really interesting that um, some programs did go through major modifications. So they had a little bit of a lead in time before the pandemic really hit, and we then had to bring in our emergency standards. So there'd been a lot of preparation before actually those there was that change made, and then of course some universities then had to adopt those 
those standards as a result of COVID. And it, there seems to be less perhaps understanding in those areas where they was, it was introduced quite quickly. Then we had an emergency standard as well. Well, that emergency standards, our council is, is being asked to withdraw that, that um, emergency standard at the end of September. So we will need to make sure that those standards are delivered now in the way they were intended with the practice supervisor being a different person to the practice assessor. But it does give fantastic opportunities as well because it means we can widen out who also can be supervisors to our students. So it gives us, you know, opportunities as well as different ways of, of, of supervising students in coaching models, etc., which we perhaps didn't have before. And I think if if um, if practice partners on the call, you know, feel they need more information about that, do go to the AEIs. And we are currently working with the regions, particularly in England, about that. So there's a lot we can do to support that. Um, as well as we've got um, a whole series of sort of um, materials that we're going to be doing throughout um, sort of October to support that change back to the standards that they were rich. But I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's about really as well students knowing, you know, what should be expected and making sure they raise it if it's not working as it should do. So they mm. get the support they need. Really, really important. Mm. I mean, there's a number of comments that are around um, around the issues relating to, to um, examination of the newborn. But um, move on to a different different point. Amy Peach is asking, are most universities implementing the new standard from this September? As, as, a, as a whole, as a total, yes. But there are some for very, very good reasons who are going who've decided that they want to go. Um, have their approval event later this year into next year and then we'll adopt them in September but by September 22 all um, across all four countries will have to have adopted them and interestingly that although they'll be adopting them for the new students we mustn't forget the students who are already on current programs because some might actually be moving across so that midwives will qualify um, you know, we'll start beginning to see some of the new students who have had all their programmes on these new standards, probably about a year, you know, maybe within about a year or so, because particularly people who are doing the um, shortened programmes. But, um, but it's very, it, it, it has to be an individualised, individual mm -hmm. approach as to when the particular universities are adopting mm -hmm. them. So it might be that some students might choose not to apply for this year if they if they know a new course is going to be starting the following year so possibly but of course many will be then if you're a, if they're first year the student may and uh, the university will make the decision as to whether they want to roll them onto the new program third year is mm. less likely but first and second years there's often opportunities to roll them straight over so that they mm. actually uh, complete most of their program on the new standards mm. so i think if amy um, Amy doesn't say whether she, she's a student or not. Does no, she? she no, no, she doesn't. No, she doesn't. Um, but I think if Amy is a student, you know, she needs to be asking those questions of the university. What is happening? When are they, you know, what does it mean for me? But if she's a midwife, she needs to ask the same questions, really, because um, you know, all midwives need to have input into how that that um, program is can, um, delivered because it's a 50-50 partnership, and of course, practice supervisors need to be very, very uh, familiar with these new programs. Absolutely. So talking about that, uh, um, Louise Armstrong. Hello, Louise. Sorry for changing the subject. No problem at all. I'm delighted the word risk is being dropped. When I ask student midwives who say in an essay or speech, the woman was high risk, I ask what of? And often they cannot reply because the term is used so liberally in practice, it has no meaning. Yeah, thank you, Louise. I mean, we, I think Verena and I are very, very in agreement. And this is actually what um, instigators trying to work and uh, present the new standards and have conversations with CQC, because there was a there was a discussion that was talking about the challenge of when you know when a woman is moving from low to high risk. And and we thought, ah, we need to start talking about the new standards, because I think women don't want to be pigeonholed, do they? you know, because somebody might have a lot of additional needs, but everything still might be quite straightforward in, 
in on her maternity journey and yet someone who might have you know, might you know label this low risk might and have a number of additional needs that might develop so mm. it's it, it's 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 unhelpful in a sense and this is why this talking about the and I think the other problem with it it, it sort of puts midwives into these boxes but actually women who do have additional needs, whatever that might be, we've changed our safety definition. It's not just about physical needs. It could be mental health. It could be spiritual. It could be cultural needs. Um, it could be, a, you know, that it depends on those needs for that woman or it could be a complication that arises. But they still need that care of the midwife who can actually often reduce some of those outcomes, those poor outcomes by that maternity care. So this is why this really thinking through this language, where you put people in low high risk boxes, it's not terribly helpful, is it? It, it also it also links in with, you know, knowing somebody really well. And the other thing that the standards sort of um, major on is relationship building, because if you've got that relationship going on where, you know, the woman really well you know her family you know the background you know the whole shebang and she knows and trusts you because you know you've been there since the beginning and she doesn't have to keep repeating herself she sees you you know that's that's a real plus because it means that you know what her wishes are and what her dreams are and what she really wants but you also know that if you have concerns that she will understand that you are concerned and that, that you're not just sort of um, making it up as you go along. Not that anybody would, but you know what I mean? They, they, there's a trust element that comes in with that relationship building, which is absolutely crucial. And again, that's one of these things that goes the whole way through the standards. And it's more about relationship building and knowing how to explain the chances of something happening or what this thing that is happening, what that means to this particular woman, the one that you're looking after and the one that you care for and the one that you know. Well, I'm afraid to say we're coming to the end of our time and oh. there's some more comments. That I know we, we, we were flowing there, weren't we? But you have to get you to come back and carry on this discussion because I think it, it is so important, actually, yeah. this issue of, of language and actually the importance mm. of it as, and the different changes that are taking place. But... I just want to say a big thank you to, to both of our wonderful speakers and also right. thank you thank as you. well to Matt Flakes for providing the video content from Maternity Experts and also the partners at the Practicing Midwife Journal and All for Maternity with their online resources that they provide for us. Um, some of us will be on social media after this um, answering any other questions that are there. there. There were one or two there, that Jackie and Verena, I don't know if you saw those, but... Um, if you are able to to have a look or Jenny if uh, I think our emails are on the slides when you get them and do please email us we're more than happy to take those queries and have those discussions mm -hmm. and I think if anybody feels that they need to have um, a bit more reinforcement or something within their practice we're always very happy to come out and speak to people while we're working online it's very easy to do but, um, you know, we're very happy to have these conversations uh, wider. Mm. Thank you. And this, this process is going to take some time, isn't it? it? Is. We need to all yeah. have a bit of patience mm. with each yeah. other while all this is, yeah. is happening at this time. <laughs> um, next week, um, the midwifery hour, there will be an online highlights actually from the maternity festival, the Wales festival during the day. So if you've not managed to attend, then there will be some highlights actually happening in the evening. Um, and in the meantime, um, for everybody, please stay safe and well um, at the moment and look after yourselves and your loved ones. And the thunderstorm that I was expecting has not yet happened. So it might just happen now as I finish. But thank you very much, everybody who's been part of this today. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thanks Bye, very everyone. much, Jenny.